There we go. Sorry about that. See, that's what you get when you're a non techer. <laughs> get with the times. Get caught up with the world, right? All right. How's everybody doing? How was the lasagna? Was it good? Good. I was worried about that because <laughs> I didn't want to serve frozen lasagna. But anyway, thanks for coming tonight, you guys. And uh, we're going to pick up our study tonight, and we're going to be in chapter 13 of Second Samuel. So let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much, Lord, that we are able to hold it in our hands and touch it and see it and possess it, Lord. What an awesome blessing that is, that you took your word and you preserved it all these years so that we could sit here and, and, and learn more about you. And we want to thank you for that. And I just want to pray, Lord, that Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher tonight, that as we read this story, God, that you would help us to glean the lessons that you would have us to see from it. And uh, we just want to thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. Lord, we want to ask you to be with those in our little family here that are, that are sick and, uh, and be with them and get them back on their feet again. And we think of Roxanne tonight, too, Lord, that you'd be with her and, and uh, give her that peace that passes all understanding, God. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So last week we... Uh, we or not last week, it's been two weeks, hasn't it? Um, so we got to see David's uh, huge mistake last week when he, uh, he couldn't control himself, and he winds up taking Bathsheba. Uh, he winds up murdering her husband. Uh, he winds up lying about it. And so we're going to pick up... Um, from there. Now you might remember before we go into this chapter, it was several chapters back when we were reading about all the wives that David had. You know, back then I guess it was pretty cool to have lots of wives. I I have a difficulty with one. I don't know how they can have more than one, but um, no, I love my wife. Um, but having all these wives gives him a lot of children from different mothers. Uh, and, of course, all of them, uh, in reality, all of them had a right at some point to the throne of Israel. Um, God had planned on who would take the throne. But as we go through here, we're going to see things that, well, because of David's mistake that he made, and I told you this when we read about it, he changed history. He changed the history of the nation of Israel and uh, it's, it's kingly line, and uh, we looked at how important it is that we make good choices in our lives because we need to understand, too, that some of the choices we make could affect other people's lives, um, a lot of other people's lives. So let's go ahead and pick this up in uh, uh, chapter 13 of Second Samuel. We see that uh, since the people... Uh, uh, had had these battles and the Ammonites and all that stuff was going on. We have, it doesn't tell us how much time, but quite a bit of time has passed now. So verse 1 of chapter 13, some time passed. And David's son, Absalom, had a beautiful sister named Tamar. And David's son, Amnon, was infatuated with her. Amnon was frustrated to the point of making himself sick over his sister Tamar because she was a virgin, but it seemed impossible to do anything to her. Amnon had a friend named uh, Jonadab, a son of David's brother Shimea. Jonadab was a very shrewd man, and he asked Amnon, why are you, the king's son, so miserable every morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon replied, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, 
lie down on your bed and pretend that you're sick. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare a meal in my presence so that I can watch and eat from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be sick. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and make me a couple of cakes in my presence so that I can eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace. Please go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare a meal for him. Then Tamar went to his house while Amnon was lying down. She took dough and she kneaded it. She made cakes in his presence and baked them. She brought the pan and set it in front of him, but he refused to eat. Amnon said, Everyone leave me. And everyone left him. Bring the meal to the bedroom, Amnon told Tamar, so that I can eat from your hand. Tamar took the cakes that she had made, and she went to her brother Amnon's bedroom. And when she brought them to him to eat, he grabbed her. And he said, Come and sleep with me, my sister. She said, Don't, my brother, she cried. Don't disgrace me, for such a thing should never be done in Israel. Don't commit this outrage. Where could I ever go with my humiliation? And you, you would be like one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Please speak to the king, for he won't keep me from you. But he refused to listen to her. And because he was stronger than she was, he disgraced her by raping her. So Amnon hated Tamar with such intensity that the hatred that he hated her with was greater than the love that he had loved her with. Get out of here, he said. No, she cried. Sending me away is much worse than the great wrong you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her, and instead he called to the servant who waited on him. Get this away from me. Throw her out and bolt the door behind her. Amnon's servant threw her out and bolted the door behind her. Now Tamar was wearing a long-sleeved garment because this is what the king's virgin daughters wore. But Tamar put ashes on her head and she tore the long-sleeved garment she was wearing and she put her hand on her head and went away crying out. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has your brother Amnon been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. So Tamar lived as a desolate woman in the house of her brother Absalom. Now when David, King David, heard about these things, he was furious. And Absalom, don't say anything to Amnon, either good or bad, because he hated Amnon since he disgraced his sister Tamar. So let's stop there for a minute. <clears throat> There's a lot of things in these verses that we just read that are really, really important. You know, on the surface you look at this and we just see a man that had no self-control, a man that was very self-absorbed, a man that perhaps felt entitled, uh, didn't really care about this young virgin. Um, all he could think about was his lust towards her and what he wanted. But I think that there's so much more here because it shows us where lust can take us. You know, when you read in James about temptation... James tells us that God doesn't tempt anybody. When we're tempted, he's not tempting us, according to the word of God. But he does allow temptation to come to us. And he does expect us to resist temptation. But 
James tells us the process that takes place when we're tempted. And the first thing he says is, we're tempted when we are drawn away by our own lust. Now, this was part of Amnon's problem. He was a lustful man. As a matter of fact, I would even go as far as to say he wasn't just physically sick, he was emotionally sick. He was a sick person. He is the king's son. He can have any woman he desires in the kingdom. But instead, he looks towards his sister. And we're going to see in here that he doesn't call her his sister. And so the reason I prefaced this reading with the idea that David had many wives and is highly doubtful that these two people were from the same mother. So they would have been step brother and stepsister, which doesn't make it any better. But I think that's an important thing to know. Another thing here that I saw here is that he's miserable every day. He's so miserable that he's sick because of the lust that's driving him. He's been drawn away by his own lust. And then James says, when lust conceives, I love that, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. And then James gives us a warning to be wise and to pay attention to his counsel. Well, this fellow here, he's trying to find any way he can absolutely find to break the rules, I suppose you would say, to sin. Not only against her, but against the throne, against the people of Israel, and most of all, against God. Do I think this man knew better? Absolutely. I think he knew better. I think that all of them knew better, including Jonadab here. Now, Jonadab is the one who, he's already got this lust, but look what Jonadab, what role is he playing here? He's setting him up. Yes, and now isn't that exactly what the enemy does? He comes along and he stokes the flame. Now, if somebody were to tell me, I've never lusted in my life, I would be hard-pressed to believe that. Because I know we've all sinned, and we've all come short of the glory of God. But part of being born again means I'm a new creature in Christ. It means that I no longer have to bow down to those lusts. I have the Holy Spirit in me that will empower me to be able to say no. That's one of the freedoms that we enjoy in Christ. Before, we were prisoners to sin. Before, we had no real defense against sin. And basically, sin was our master, because that's how we lived our lives. And when I say sin was our master, I don't necessarily mean going out and doing horrible acts every single day. But we're living in the flesh back then. We're living in the ways of the world back then. We're not walking with God. Sin means to fall short. Sin means, well, it's actually an archery term. And I love Paul in his writings because he must have been a sporting fan. Yeah, he talks about quite a few, you know, he talks about, you know, the games. He talks about wrestling. He talks about all kinds of different things like that, running races. Um, so I think that he was kind of a sports, maybe, uh, enthusiast himself. Um, but the thing, before we know the Lord... Let me go backwards. Jesus said, 
whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Now, I've read that a thousand times, but I have to ask myself the question, free from what? What have I been set free from? I'm not talking about forgiveness here. I mean, we've been forgiven, and there's a freedom in forgiveness, but what have I been set free from? I've been set free from the fact that all my life I was a slave to sin. All my life I did not have what it took to refuse it. Whether it would be hatred in my heart, whether it would be stealing, whether, whatever it might be, you know, I think when we use the word sin, we usually go, we think the worst, you know. But when Paul uses the word, and he says we've all come short of the glory of God, he uses that illustration because this is an archery term. And, and back in those times, one of the sporting events was an archery event where they would come out with their bows and their arrows. And, and uh, there was a competition where a man would have a a pole in his hand, and at the top of the pole there would be a, a, a round hoop. And he would get so far away from the archers, and they would all line up, and they would shoot the arrows. When the arrows went through the hoop, it was counted to them as a point. When it missed the hoop, it was counted to them as a sin, or missing the mark, which I like that definition of it. So say I've put two arrows through, they're going to take that hoop and they're going to move it further away from me. Some have said that they go get another hoop that's even smaller. And the further away you go, the smaller it gets. And so eventually they get to a point where all of these competitors, maybe the hoop is so far away their arrow falls short of gaining the reward. And so Paul uses this illustration to tell us we've all missed the target. We've all come short and we've all sinned. But Jesus said, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to give you the ability to stand on your feet with with his strength, with the tools that he's given me. I heard somebody praying tonight about the armor of God. And I think sometimes it's good for us to go back and read about the armor of God to remind us of the kind of tools that God has given to us so that we can do battle against the enemy. So here we have Jonadab here um, really playing a, 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 an evil role in feeding this lust that this guy has for his stepsister. And he comes up. Now, and here's another thing, too. Have you ever met people, and I'm sure you have, who are very wealthy, or people who seem like they have it all? I mean, they got the looks, they got the boats, they got the motorcycles, they got the cars, they got the house, they got the, you know, the arm candy wife, they got all that stuff going on, and they're absolutely miserable. Because possessions cannot bring happiness to a human being. As a matter of fact, the Bible says our life is, is not made up of the things that we own. Our lives don't consist of our possessions. Our lives are much more than that. But here we see this man giving bad counsel, bad advice. Now, if he would have been a friend... Um, Because if you look at verse 3, it says Amnon had a friend named Jonadab. Well, that kind of a friend, who needs enemies, right? So does that mean to tell me that, you know what, I might have acquaintances out there in the world that I might consider a friend, but would I sit down and take counsel from them? If it's not biblical, if it's not Christian-based, why would I want to receive counsel from someone like that? So he's an uncle. But also it says Amnon had a friend named Jonadab. He was a son of David's brother 
Shimea. And he was a very shrewd man. Now, you got to know that... <laughs> have you ever had a, heard of a television show called Downton Abbey? Huh? Um, my wife's addicted to that show. And I've sat in on a couple of those episodes. And it's amazing to see all these people that have everything you could ever want, and they're all scheming and gossiping and lying and trying to take each other out and having affairs, you know, in the back rooms and in the closets and all this stuff's going on. You're thinking, oh my gosh. You get an idea of what it might have been like in the palace with all of these people competing with one another, all of them having their own agenda, and I would put the blame on David. David wasn't a very good father. He did not set a good example for his kids. As a matter of fact, I think David was a person who turned his eyes away from things a lot so that he didn't have to deal with it. Perhaps he felt so guilty because of the things that he did, he felt like he could not discipline his kids, but I don't believe that to be true. I think he was just a bad father. So this man, Jonadab, He's got this wonderful plan. Pretend you're sick. Now, Tamar was probably a very sweet young lady. An innocent lady. And we see what happens here when he pretends to be sick. And David comes and he requests this young virgin to come and feed him food. But another thing he said is, I want her to come and cook in front of me so I can watch. When I read that, I thought, wow, he has really got a problem here. Let her prepare a meal in my presence so that I can watch and eat from her hand. What a great plan. You know, this plan's almost as good as his dad's plan was to take out Bathsheba, husband Uriah. Wasn't that a great plan, too? And we see where it got him. When you make plans apart from God, you can be assured that your sin, what does the Bible say about sin? Your sin will find you out. You can only cover it up for so long. So he does. He goes on with this facade that he's... Uh, trying to lure her in. And certainly, he does lure her in. And it's interesting to note that he has a bunch of attendants in the room with him. He's not alone. He's got a bunch of people in there with him. Now you would think, well, maybe that will deter him. No, it didn't deter him. He threw them all out. And after he threw them all out, it was just him and her. In his bedroom. Now, because of what Tamar's response is to this, like I said a minute ago, I think that she was really a, a gentle spirit, a, a woman of values. And she went in there with a heart to serve. Now, you know what? Another thing that happens to us sometimes, we have a gentle heart towards people. We want to serve them. And sometimes we reach out to serve people and we get bit. We get stabbed. We feel like they've taken advantage of us or, or whatever it might be. And I think that just comes with the territory. If I'm trying to serve a person that doesn't know the Lord... It wouldn't be beyond a stretch to think that they might take advantage of me. So he takes advantage of her. Don't disgrace me, she said. Please, don't disgrace me. This is something that should not happen in Israel. This is against God. This is wrong. But of course, it doesn't deter him one little bit. He forced her, literally, raped her. Now here's the crazy thing about lust. 
When lust conceives, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. This love that he thought that he had for Tamar instantly turns to hatred. He got what he wanted. And now perhaps he's feeling like it was part her fault. And now he's in a compromised position. And now he hates her because that wasn't true love. That kind of love that he had was a self-love for his own self. And sadly enough, you know, a lot of people when they get married, that's why they get married. They get married because they don't want to be alone. They get married because they want somebody to love them. They get married for the benefit of that. And most of the time, those kind of marriages don't work out. Why should we be getting married? Because I love her. Or I love him. And I want to serve that person with my marriage to them. I can't tell you how many times I sit down with couples. Well, he's doing this all the time. She's doing that all the time. And you come to find out pretty quick that they're both very self-absorbed people. They want their way. And pretty soon, what happens is because they're not getting their way and the friction starts rubbing against each other and things start getting hot and it can get really, really ugly and even to the point where they feel hatred towards one another. That's not love. That is not the love that God wants us to love our spouses with. And you know that. I don't need to tell you that. Hold it for me. <clears throat> so Amnon hated Tamar. And look what happened in verse 16. Sending me away is worse than the great wrong that you've already done. Now, I think Tamar is thinking to herself, let's just go to dad, tell him what's happened, and maybe he'll give us his blessing and we can get married. Wouldn't have been too far out of the realm of possibility because he said all you had to do was just ask the king and he probably would have given me to you. So maybe in her mind she's thinking, well, I, you know, I, had, I got raped, he's mistreated me, but I'll go ahead and marry him. We'll get married and we'll, we'll figure it out. Amnon didn't want anything to do with that. He, he's hating on her. And she's saying, if you send me away, that's even worse than the wrong that you've already done to me. You're going to cause me to live in shame by doing that. And you forced me. <laughs> Verse 17 says, he called the servant who waited on him. And the words in this translation say, get this away from me. Doesn't even have the word her. He looked at her as a, a thing, not a person. Throw her out and bolt the door behind her. I don't want her to be able to get in here ever again. And of course, his servant did it. Now you can see her dressed in this beautiful dress, long sleeves, covered, her whole body is covered up, probably all the way down to her feet. It was a sign that she was covered up and she was saving herself and she was a virgin. And look how she responds. She puts ashes on her head, which is a statement of confession and for asking for forgiveness. And it says that she tore the dress that she wore. Now, I was reading a little bit about that part right there and what the guy was saying, the one that I was reading. And you always got to take what the commentators, kind of sometimes with a grain of salt. <clears throat> but what he said was, she tore the sleeves off of her dress, which signified that she was no longer a virgin. Don't know for sure. Just a thought. 
But now she's been thrown out. She's been taken advantage of. She's been used. And she went away crying. So Absalom said, Has your brother Amnon been with you? Verse 20. Be quiet for now, my sister. <laughs> His time's going to come. His sin will find him out. But don't take this thing to heart. In other words, don't you feel guilty. Don't beat yourself up. You're a victim here. You know. So when King David heard about it, how did he respond? He was furious. Just like he was furious about the man who took his neighbor's little lamb and ate it. That man shall surely die. And what did the prophet tell him? You're that man. How really angry could he have possibly truly been? He wants to cover this. He didn't learn anything from, from his mistake with Uriah. Because the first thing he wants to do is he wants to cover it up. He was furious. Absalom didn't say anything to Amnon, either good or bad, because Absalom hated Amnon since he disgraced his sister Tamar. So now we've got two years now that's gone by. <clears throat> it's amazing how you can fly through time in the Scripture, you know. Two years from <laughs> verse 22 to verse 33, or 23. So two years later, probably Absalom is thinking, everything is blown over. My stepsister is living in shame at, at uh, uh, Amnon's house, uh, Absalom's house. And two years have gone by. Absalom's sheep shearers were at Baal Hazer near Ephraim. And Absalom invited all of the king's sons. So he went to the king and he said, Your servant has just hired sheep shearers. Will the king and his servants please come with your servant? The king replied, David, of course, replied to Absalom, No, my son, we should not all go, or we would be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he wasn't willing to go. Oh, he did bless him. I'll give you my blessing, Absalom. Here again is a negligent parent. Come and enjoy the family feast and, you know, hang out with your kids and enjoy your family. And no, I can't do it. But I'll give you my blessing. Go have a good time. Oh, well, he says, if not, he said, please let my brother Amnon go with us. The king asked him, why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, and so he sent Amnon and all of the king's sons. Now Absalom commanded his young men, watch Amnon until he is in a good mood from the wine. And when I order you to strike Amnon, then kill him. Don't be afraid. I am not the one. Am I not the one who has commanded you? Be strong and valiant. So Absalom's young men did to Amnon, just as Absalom had commanded. And then all the rest of the king's sons got up, and they each fled on their mule. While they were on the way, a report reached David, saying, Absalom struck down all the king's sons. Oh, my goodness. A little bit of gossip going on here, maybe, or what? All of the sons are gone, you know. That's kind of how it goes. So in response, the king stood and tore his clothes, and he laid down on the ground, and all of his servants stood by with their clothes torn. Could you imagine that? You see that in your head? All these guys standing around David, all of his attendants or counselors or whatever they are, and he's got this rumor that they're all gone, they're all dead, and he tears his clothes, and everyone's standing around going, well, he tore his, I guess we need to tear ours too, right? <laughs> you know. So everybody tears their clothes. A sign of grieving, a sign of pain. Pain. 
But Jonadab, the son of David's brother, Shemiah, spoke up. My Lord must not think that they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, because only Amnon is dead. In fact, Absalom has planned this ever since the day Amnon disgraced his sister Tamar. Two years in the planning. Just waiting for the right moment. So now, my lord the king, don't take seriously this report that says all the king's sons are dead. Only Amnon is dead. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, <laughs> Amslom has fled. And when the young man who was standing watch looked up, there were many people coming from the road west of him, from the side of the mountain. Jonadab said to the king, Look, the king's sons have come. It's exactly like your servant said. Just as he finished speaking, the king's sons entered and wept loudly. Then the king and all of his servants also wept very bitterly. But Absalom fled, and he went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. After Absalom had fled to Geshur and had been there three years, King David longed to go to Absalom, for David had finished grieving over Anon's death. So we got quite a bit of time passing here, but we get a sense that the pain of what happened lingers. He's, he's still in a state of mourning three years later. So now we've got five years since it happened. And finally, he is to a place now where he's ready to move on. He's missing Absalom. For a man that has so much wisdom, a man that has so much of a connection with the voice of God, he was really dumb. Sorry. But he made some really dumb decisions. And it just continually compounds in his life. It gets worse and worse. During his mourning, is it possible that he said, gosh, you know, this is my fault. Because I, I, I shirked my responsibility as, a, as the father. And you know, Absalom, he is such a good-looking guy. He, you know, he's, he's tall. He's fair. He's got this long, flowing hair. Boy, he'll make a good king someday. And I know he's made a mistake and everything, but that son over there is kind of scrawny from that wife over there. Oh, I really didn't like that. He's looking, he's sizing him up, and Absalom is the guy. Not a good choice. We're going to find out very soon that Absalom was not a good choice. Absalom would revolt against his father and bring much more blood and misery into David's life. But yet, this is the one that he wanted back so badly. What about all the other boys? What about the rest of the sons? There's no mention that he changed his ways, decided we're going to have family barbecues every week, we're going to heal from this, and we're going to move forward. None of that. <laughs> so again, I ask the question, how could he be a man after God's own heart? I'm still confused about that. Except that I believe in my heart that God knew his heart. I believe he compromised in his life. He lied. I don't know if any of you watched that, any of that trial that was on a week or two ago. <clears throat> but what was his downfall? 
lying. And I think it just got to the point where he forgot what kind of lies he had told and started crisscrossing over his own lies, and it caught him. David's pretty good at that, too. He's pretty good at conspiring. He's pretty good at planning bad things. And, of course, so was his son, spending two years planning the death of his half-brother. Why did the other sons run away from his house when they took Absalom out? I don't know. But they ran away afraid, thinking that they're going to be next. <laughs> and I think it's kind of cute. They all got on their mules and ran away. You know, little tiny mules. You, can see, you ever see these guys riding mules over there? It's pretty hilarious, actually. <clears throat> But what are we taking home tonight? Well, our choices have consequences. If we're listening to the wrong counsel, disaster can happen. If we're trying to fight this weakness of lust in our own power, we will fail. It will be our downfall. As a matter of fact, I think we experience spiritual death um, eventually as a result of covering these things up, lying, making the bad choices, whatever. So we're going to see how this thing plays out. We're going to continue down through here next week. And, and uh, very interesting what happens. But you got to feel for, for Tamar because I haven't seen any hiding her hair of her. She's living in shame. Will she ever be restored? Will she ever move back to the palace? Will she ever have a husband? Or is she despised because of what he did to her? Well, maybe we'll learn that. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you. I am so thankful tonight that we have this record that we can look at. And, you know, Paul... Paul told us that all of these things in the Old Testament is they're our schoolmaster. They're there to teach us what to do and what not to do. And I want to thank you, Lord, that we have these real life examples of what kind of a path going against your word can take us on. Always a path of destruction and fruitlessness. So Lord, as we go home tonight, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us, that we would have ears to hear. Lord, if we have bitterness, unforgiveness, hatred, if we think ourselves to be better, than someone else. Oh God, help us. Help us to confess those things. Because Lord, it's easy for us to bury those things and hide them from those around us. And we can put on a pretty good costume, but God, you see right through it. We're not fooling you. So Lord, if you do reveal these things and and I'm sure there's things that you're working on each and every one of us. Whatever they might be, help us to allow you to yield to you, to allow you to continue to shape us into what you want us to be. That you would continue, Lord, to change the way we think. That we would not be conformed to the world, but we would be transformed in our minds because of your word. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right.